What is up, guys? It's near Halloween, I guess, so... That should explain the spooky uh, lighting, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, hi. Today, I'm here to talk about more CDs! Woo! I know, right? Amazing. I want to get it done before I impulse buy more CDs, so without further ado, let's get into it. And in no particular order of when I've received them, or any alphabetical order, or anything like that. Let's start off with the uh, first CD. It's the Cardigans Emmerdale. The interesting thing about this CD is that uh, it's a Swedish CD. It, uh, the Cardigans are originally from Sweden, I don't know if you know that. Their main hit being, you know, Love Fool. They're mostly known as a one-hit wonder over here, but they've had a few hits other places. But they're really big in Sweden and Germany. And in fact, Emmerdale, their first album, uh, was originally only released uh, physically in Sweden and Germany. I mean, later on it received a physical in other countries, but I have the, like, original version of the release, which is kind of uncommon. Uh, the, the album itself is interesting because the lead singer, I forget her name, but uh, her voice has always remained the same throughout her whole career. The, s the sound uh, aesthetically of the, the band has changed, so it's a nice kind of contrast between the more bubblegum pop sides of the more recent albums. And this one, which is more like a lounge sort of jazz act, uh, which it's kind of a nice juxtaposition. I'm not really used to it yet, but I'm sure it'll grow on me more. Uh, but yeah, this is a great uh, debut album by the Cardigans, and it was kind of an indicator of how their music would be in the future for sure. Next up is a uh, this is a, the CD came out I believe 1989, I think, but the original album was released well before uh, CDs were a thing. I think it was 1970 something. Uh, this is still crazy after all these years by Paul Simon and. You wouldn't think it given my music taste and what's on my playlist, but I'm actually, in fact, actually, I think you would because a Paul Simon song from this very album is on my playlist. But the funny thing is, um, I'm a big Paul Simon fan, which not really his new stuff, but like I'm talking like pre Graceland. I like a lot of this uh, stuff from that. I'm a real big fan. So, um, yeah, and I think out of all the out of all the albums pre Graceland, it's this this one's the best. This one uh, right here. It's very, uh, it's very laid back. It's very chill, kind of like how I am right now. And uh, it's a very nice reprieve from his previous album, Rhyme and Simon, which is definitely more of like an upbeat sort of ho hokey, uh, folky album. Uh, one thing I, I find interesting about this album, which I, I don't really know if it gets reported on very much, is that the last track on the album is like a Jewish sort of, like it's like you know you heard like Christian song. It's kind of a Jewish song actually, like. He talks a lot about his, his Jewish faith in, uh, in that last track, which I thought, this thought was interesting because I didn't really know, because I knew Paul Simon was Jewish, I didn't really know to what level Paul Simon believed in Judaism, but apparently at, at, during that time he was very devoted to to uh, Judaism, so I thought that was interesting. But yeah, that, that, that was sort of, uh, that sort of took me aback, and uh, I learned to appreciate the album more, you know, than, than beyond the title track, I think, with purchase of that album which is mainly what I do with all these CDs I try to uh, try to buy them and enjoy them as if I were when buying them from a store however many years ago you know that sort of experience the next one is a this is the only one I could really find and whoever sold it to me really didn't know what they have it's best rap in 1996-2008 by Ego Rappin which is funny because Ego Raptor Ego Rappin I wonder uh, if that's a similarity that is a coincidence or not I don't know but either way um, it's a great jazz album. I know the theme today is basically just lo-fi and jazz, right? Because <laughs> uh, the interesting thing about the Paul Simon album, going back to that, is that it has a lot of the same sort of low fidelity from the original release that was m mastered on tape, and they didn't really do any like remastering on that release, which I, I appreciate. I, I appreciate when songs and, and albums are more, uh, more sort of resemble their original form. And going back to ego rapping, I. I listened to one track off the album, I have it on my playlist, but I didn't realize how many great songs they have, and how many songs are actually in English. It's not great English, it was interesting to see that a lot of Igor uh, you know, discography is, is sung in English, which I thought was interesting. Or if not sung in English, has kind of a mix between Japanese and English in the lyrics. Um, 
And basically the lyrics written that I can tell from the book inlaid in the album, they're, they're not bad. They're not bad lyrics. I mean, obviously I don't know the Japanese parts. I could look that up in any time. I think had it not been pointed out when I went inside the book and, and looked at it, I would have realized that half the tracks were in English. Some of them it's hard to tell. The accent is very thick on the on the female singer of Igarapin. Next is a bit of an offshoot, something random. It's the Akiba Strip HD original soundtrack. This came with my uh, Switch copy of uh, Akiba's Trip HD. It's a good game. I mean, soundtrack's all right. It just came with the game. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have bought it on its own. Um, yeah, it's it's a nice sort of uh, soundtrack. I mean, nothing special. I mean. It fits the game also that much. I mean, it, there's no real standout track on it. Uh, it's just a nice collectible, I guess. I mean, I, I didn't pay anything extra to get it, so I'm not too upset about it. You know, the, the collector's edition I bought was way cheaper than any other version I could have got. So honestly, I'm not complaining. At the time, it was the best-selling independent album of all time, uh, especially physically. It probably still holds that record. Uh, it sold a ridiculous amount of copies. Anyway, it's Offspring's Smash. Not THE Offspring, as they were later known as. Offspring. Yeah, I mean, there's a few acts that have done that. Like, a previous uh, band I covered, The Prodigy, originally went by Prodigy in their uh, debut albums. And the Smashing Pumpkins have gone by Smashing Pumpkins in the past. You know, various groups have done this, where they've added or subtracted the from their title. For some reason, I don't know why. There's no controversial takes here. I like it. I mean, there's a reason why, the reason why it sold so many copies because it was, you know, I would say even great sound for the time and certainly broke some boundaries for sure. I mean, but going back to the actual album itself, uh, Dexter uh, from uh, Offspring or The Offspring has definitely took, taken a different direction than Billy Joe Armstrong from uh, from Green Day. So I think I think he's taken a more laid back approach with this singing, whereas. Billy Joe's done the opposite, and I like Dexter because of it. Although the music's mostly stayed the same quality, maybe a little bit worse, not really the same decline that Green Day has. They're very comparable groups, I think. Moving on to something completely off subject from the last one, we have the Super Smash Brothers for, you know, 3DS and Wii U uh, soundtrack that you got as a reward from Nintendo, Club Nintendo. Uh, I paid 420 for this on eBay plus shipping, but I thought that was funny because haha, weed number. I'm immature. Um, yeah, this is great. I mean, I already owned this uh, legally, totally not illegally, um, uh, in various forms, uh, but now I officially own it. I know it's great because it has a lot of the great Nintendo uh, songs that I know slap. I mean, there's not much that can really be said about the Smash soundtrack. It's been talked talked about to death, so I'm gonna leave it at that. I mean, that's there's better things to be discussed. Like for example, Mea Culpa's Blindfolds and Cigarettes. Now, what is that? I don't really know either. I found it at Goodwill for a dollar. I can't find much information about it. Oh, there goes the dogs again. <laughs> I think we're I think we're good. Um, Mea Culpa is a group from somewhere. I don't know where. Uh, they sound, if I were to give them comparisons, they sound like a mix of the lead singer of They Might Be Giants if he was a bit tone deaf and uh, and then he made music in the style of Bare Naked Ladies. So it's kind of a grating listen after a little bit, but it's a nice initial listen, I'll give it that. Uh, it's, it's just a bit off, just the music itself is a bit off and it doesn't sound particularly right. It's, it's kind of disharmonious. It's I wouldn't say I particularly think it's worth more than I paid for it. I mean, it's nothing special at all. It is pretty much something you could easily skip if it were on Spotify, if any of the songs were to pop up. So yeah, that's my general take on Mea Culpa's Blindfolds and Cigarettes. Up next is Real Big Fish. Turn the radio off. This is what I found at uh, at my local uh, uh, CD shop. Real Big Fish is a ska band. Yeah, so Real Big Fish, I think the cover's very interesting. It's definitely something that, like, if you look at it, like, I don't, I don't really know if this this is age of the best. This is sort of edgy, even for its time. I mean, it's not exactly uh, in good taste. <laughs> but the album itself is great. I mean, it's a bit sort of try hardy but I think that's just sort of Real Big Fish's aesthetic anyways, to be a bit try hardy But uh, yeah, I mean, 
A very nice discography. And actually, some of the songs on the album don't exactly age the best either, truth be told. But it doesn't age horribly either. But it's it's sort of like in between sort of uh, what's acceptable and what isn't. Sleigh Bells Treats. Uh, Sleigh Bells Treats is uh, it's like Death Grips, but for party girls. I'm not even joking. Like, literally, it is the same volume and intensity as something like Death Grips. And it annoys anybody you, you put on, you put this music on in the car with, to the same level, I think. I think uh, I think there's a lot of the comparisons. And, and, you know, freaking uh, Sleigh Bells and Death Grips came out around the same time. Next time I'll see you, uh, I'll be... It'll be a different day because I can't get through the rest of this without uh, interruptions. So I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Sup, guys. I'm back again. It's morning now. I tried recording last night, but I was too tired and the, the take was shite. Anyway, uh, here is the album I was talking about last time before I had to stop. It's Sleigh Bells by Treats. Oh, sorry, no correction. It's Treats by Sleigh Bells. Sleigh Bells is a group uh, that was formed uh, in the early 2000s, maybe late 90s, early 2000s. I, I, I don't exactly remember. It's, it's an EDM group. There's a lot of EDM groups to today in, these, in this batch of CDs, as well as jazz groups like I previously established. The main thing about it is it's definitely not what I was expecting given, given the song that I listened to uh, that inspired me to buy the album itself. Cross by Justice. Yes, the album is just called uh, A Symbol of a Cross, but because I can't pronounce that, I have to call it Cross. That's what people typically call it. Um, it is the debut album by Justice, and I believe they're a, a duo from Paris, kind of similar to, you know, uh, to the famous one, da 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 Daft Punk. But uh, this one, I haven't listened to extensively yet, but I have listened to most of the tracks all on my own, but I haven't gotten the full album experience. I can't really say if it's good or not. I'm pretty sure it is. But yeah, it's interesting because this is like a very famous album, you know, in certain circles. I mean, I'm sure my parents probably haven't heard of them, but most people on the internet have heard of this album and have heard a track or two from it, depending on what, what you've seen or listened to. So for sure, it's, it's a classic. And, uh, oh yeah, there is something in particular I wanted to show about this CD, as opposed to the other ones which I haven't been showing. It's completely black. The actual, uh, the actual, I think you can see a little bit, if you look at the actual indentations, that's how it, it indicates what kind of album it is by the, uh, yeah, you can see, you can vaguely see it on camera, but all the labels are indented in a pure black cover CD which is insane to me. But, uh, I mean, I guess it's not that insane, but I thought it was kind of crazy. This is the newest addition to the CD collection. It just arrived, you know, meaning that I could make this video, and I thought, wow, I mean, what, what, a, what a great addition to the collection. 13 by Blur. Blur is the group by uh, Damon Albarn and company. But this is the group he was in before he was in uh, Gorillaz. But I, I love Blur. Blur, I, w I wish I wish Damon and company would come back together and make another Blur album. It, it's a classic. Coffee and TV is like a straight classic in my opinion. You, can, you can't go wrong with Blur. I mean, a Song 2 is alright, but you gotta you got go deeper than just that. I mean, seriously. It is a great band with great uh, instrumentals and great uh, aesthetic. And I love listening to it. Um, so yeah. And that's all I really have to say about that. You know, straight quoting Forrest Gump. Anyway, I hope to uh, talk to you in the comments or wherever. Uh, peace.